Our video of the Old Testament reading showed us a valley of dry bones stretching as far as the eye could see. What tragedy happened there? The scripture seems to indicate that it was perhaps an army of men who were slain in battle. A tragedy. Our New Testament reading was the story of Lazarus, the only brother, the only support of Mary and Martha, cut down in the prime of life. Tragedy? If you haven't already figured it out, our T word for today is tragedy. We have been, during our Lenten series, talking about a different T each Sunday. Things like testimony and teacher and thirsty and today is tragedy. Just what is a tragedy? Have you experienced one in your life personally? And really, is it the same in our eyes as it is in God's? You know, some people I come across, I'm sure you've met this type of person, who feel like every day their life is just one series of tragic things after another. Well, that's not really the kind of people I'm talking about today. Our definition, our human definition of tragedy is an event causing great suffering, destruction, distress. A great event that is caused by maybe a serious accident, crime, or natural catastrophe. We have lots of synonyms for the word disaster, calamity, misfortune, trial, tribulation, affliction. Just what is tragedy? You know, the Greeks really began the art form of tragedy thousands of years ago. The Romans adopted it from them. It progressed and, and probably reached its high art form with the works of William Shakespeare. Uh, if you've been to any of Shakespeare's plays, things like uh, Hamlet and Othello and um, Anthony and Cleopatra, King Lear, all of those, if you've got to see. And of course, the most famous probably is Romeo and Juliet, where the tragic hero meets misfortune. But do we really understand tragedy. Let me ask you again. Have you personally in your life experienced a tragedy? And most importantly, again, does God look at it the same as we do? Our New Testament story opens with Jesus and his disciples, and they're back in Galilee. They've crossed out of Judea because there were Jews trying to stone Jesus and kill him. And so they have left the area. And then comes word to them that Lazarus is ill. Mary and Martha want Jesus to come right away to heal their brother. They know he's a great healer. And yet Jesus waits. How many more days? He waits two more days before he travels there. And lo and behold, Martha comes out to meet him. And what is the very first thing she says to him? What does she say? I think this is a typical woman. I would have said it too. Lord, if you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. If you notice, later on in the passage, Mary's going to say the exact same thing. If you'd have been here, he wouldn't have died. Ladies, are we good at things like that? If you, if you could have done something about this. And man, I want you to know what his reaction was. What does he do? He's very calm. That's the best reaction you can have when your spouse or your wife or someone says, you could have done. And he very calmly says, your brother will rise again. Martha thinks he's talking about the last resurrection, right? The final days. And, and she is firmly a believer in the resurrection, which is, is very interesting because it was a big controversy during those days. The, the Sadducees, the religious ruling body, didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe there was any laughter, afterlife. They firmly believed that this was it. This is all you got. But the Pharisees and most of the common uh, people believed in the resurrection. 
And Martha was one of those, and she said, yes, Lord, I know he'll rise again at the end of time. And Jesus very calmly, again, and matter-of-factly says, no, I'm talking about watching and believing and seeing the glory of God right now. Tragedy or opportunity? What exactly was Lazarus' death? You know, we are often blinded and don't see the glory of God around us. I want you to think about that for a moment. God's glory surrounds us all the time. And I'm not just talking about creation. Yes, creation, the sunshine, and, and you can't help but go outside now and see God's glory, the, the little the flowers that are coming, the buds on the tree, the new life, the resurrection. But God's glory surrounds us all the time in the people that we experience, in the relationships that we have. Jesus comes and he arrives and says, you are going to see God's glory if you only believe. I love the fact that he, he goes out to the tomb and, and all of the people come out. You know, friends have come to visit and to mourn with the sisters. It was very common during uh, Jewish mourning that the first three days you were allowed to have very, very heavy mourning. You were uh, just weeping and wailing and you sat around for three days and your friends all came and they sat with you. And then that was followed by four more days, so a whole week uh, of very heavy mourning. And then a total of 30 days of mourning. So they, are, uh, they have been mourning for at least four days because we know Lazarus has been in the tomb how many days? Four days. That's significant because the Jews also believed that a person's spirit hovered near their body for three days. But after four, it was gone. And so the fact that Jesus waited four days was to show the people that this was truly a miraculous event to call the spirit back after four days. He gets to the tomb, and what does he do? He weeps. If you're ever asked in a trivia question, what's the shortest verse in the Bible? That's it, John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. He wept. Just why was he weeping? Have you ever thought about that? Think about it for a minute. Is he weeping because his good friend Lazarus has died? Uh, but he knows that he's going to bring him back to life. He already knows what the miracle that's going to happen. Is he weeping in community and in, uh, as part of the fellowship with the other, the sisters and the friends, and, and simply weeping? It does say he was troubled in spirit. Is he weeping in community with them? I think that that's a good, um, this scripture is a good way to show us that when we weep, God weeps also. When we mourn, God mourns also. But I also wonder if, contrary to our thinking, if he was weeping because he had to call Lazarus back to life. He had to ask Lazarus, to come back to this earthly life. You know, we're celebrating. We're having this wonderful celebration because Lazarus comes back to life. But have you ever thought about the fact that Lazarus had been ill, he passed through death, and he had gone on to eternal life? He had made it. He had arrived. There's a, uh, an old... A uh, Christian song of the 80s that talks about Lazarus being at, uh, in eternal life and in, in, in heaven. And he's talking with Moses and he's joking with uh, Noah. And they're all testifying about what God's done for him. And then all of a sudden at this grand reunion with all of these saints, he hears a voice. Lazarus, come forth. If that didn't wake you up in the back pews, it should have. And, and, and in this song, Lazarus is like, what? what? What is that? 
And he has to leave. He has to leave all his new friends there. And he has to go back. Tragedy or opportunity to see God's glory. You know, it's fascinating that what we see as tragedy, I wonder if sometimes we can see the glory of God coming through. Sometimes we don't. I want to read you a quote that I came across. It was in uh, some American Baptist Women material. It was in their Connection newsletter. It was a quote by Rick Warren, who was being interviewed. And uh, he was asked, what is the purpose of life? Rick Warren, you remember, is the pastor who wrote uh, the book, The Purpose Driven Life, and sold over 15 million copies of that book, and it was uh, it was studied in every church. I'm sure you looked and read it here too, back in the day. He says, people ask me what is the purpose of life, and I respond in a nutshell, life, life is preparation for eternity. We were not made to last forever, and God wants us to be with him in heaven. One day my heart is going to stop, and that will be the end of my body, but not the end of me. I may live 60 to 100 years on earth, but I'm going to spend trillions, trillions of years in eternity. This is a warm-up act. It's a dress rehearsal. God wants us to practice on earth what we will do forever in eternity. We were made by God and for God, and until you figure that out, Life isn't going to make sense. He goes on to say, life is a series of problems. Have you discovered that? Either you're in a problem now, you're just coming out of one, or you're getting ready to go into another one. <laughs> kind of pessimistic. Or realistic, maybe. The reason for this, he says, is that God is more interested in your character than your comfort. God is more interested in making your life holy than he is making your life happy. We can be reasonably happy here on earth, but that's not the goal of life. The goal is to grow in character, in Christ-likeness. I don't know about you, but I had it all wrong. I thought the goal in life was to be happy. I can remember in college interviewing students for a thesis paper I was writing and asking them what their number one goal in life was. I was expecting answers like, I want to get rich, I want to find a job, I want to, you know, a whole list of I wants. And most of them, 70, over 75% of them said, I just want to be happy. My goal is to be happy. Do you think that's what life is all about? I don't think that that's necessarily true. The goal is to grow in character, in Christ-likeness. It's interesting to me that Rick, Rick Warren shared those words the same year that his wife was diagnosed with cancer. He says that he and his wife Kay discovered quickly that in spite of the prayers of literally hundreds and thousands of people, God was not going to heal her or to make it any easier for her. And yet God has strengthened her character. He says, given her a ministry of helping other people, given her a testimony, and drawn her closer to him and to people. Tragedy or opportunity to see God's glory. What was the outcome that day of Lazarus being raised from the dead? The scripture is very plain about this. It says it very matter-factorly. It says that many of the friends who came out from Jerusalem believed in Jesus, believed that he was the Messiah, the Son of God. Their lives were changed. They gained eternity. One final personal story. I confess I haven't had much tragedy in my life. So it's kind of um, 
misleading, I guess, for me to talk about it. Someone else maybe should have talked about it. But my mother, when she was 77 years old, had a heart attack. She went to our small local hospital, and there they diagnosed it as a very slight, a minor heart attack. But they did refer her and send her on by ambulance to the university hospital that was a couple hours away. The doctors there uh, immediately said that no, she had had a massive heart attack, actually. And they stabilized her, and in the following days, she had a procedure uh, to check just how much damage there was and uh, what needed to be done. They discovered that the lower half of her heart really was permanently damaged and that she would require medication the rest of her life as well as uh, open-heart surgery. The doctor felt that she was stable and it would be better for her to uh, go home, be on the medication for a few weeks, and come back in three weeks for the surgery. Uh, I forgot to tell you that my mother hated to take medicine. She literally hated to take pills. She couldn't or wouldn't swallow them. If she took an aspirin, she would literally take it, put it in a teaspoon, grind it up, and then put some water with it and take the aspirin. She would not swallow a pill. If it was a capsule, she'd break it open, put it in some water, and you can imagine the horrible taste that you would get from the medications. For her to have to take nine medications, she, she was just horrified by the thought. Well, uh, it was Monday, and she was going to be dismissed on Tuesday. So my brothers, uh, I talked my brothers into going home, getting a night's rest, coming back and picking her up in the morning. And I would stay with her that evening, which I did. But she was doing really well uh, by about midnight. And I said, well, I'm going to let you go to sleep and I'll uh, be back in the morning. And I went home to Illinois. The next morning, the hospital called about 6 a.m., just as I was getting ready to leave, and she had code blued and died. Uh, the doctors really, they asked permission to do an autopsy because they felt like that the heart wasn't bad enough to have caused this. And so we granted them permission to do it. The autopsy showed that it was indeed another heart attack. And it also found out that she had bladder cancer. So if uh, she had lived, she would have had to begin treatment for cancer. She would have had to have her open heart surgery. She would have, most horrible to her, have taken her nine medications daily. And she would have had a very modified and limited lifestyle. On the other hand, her death opened the door to eternal life in heaven. Tragedy or opportunity? A few more e years here on earth? Or as Rick Warren says, a trillion years in eternity? Listen again to these words from him. Life is preparation for eternity. We were not made to last forever, and God wants us to be with him in heaven. Life is a series of problems, or tragedies, as we might call them. But God is more interested in making your life holy, holy, than happy. The goal of life is to grow in character, to be more Christ-like. Tragedy or opportunity? You decide. Let's pray.